Okay, our next guest is Mr. George Moore. George was with the 1252nd Engineer Battalion in General Patton's Third Army as it made its way uh, through the difficult counterattack into the Ardennes. George has a lot of wonderful stories for you today. Please welcome George Moore. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you for the folks there that invited me up here. It's indeed a pleasure to be here and talk to you people. I'm not going to go freelance like everybody else has been doing. I got, it took me three nights to write this speech, so I'm going to go through it. <laughs> so uh, and it took my wife three, mo three more nights and days to uh, revise it edit it and print it so I can see it with my weak eyes. Anyway, here I am. Rita had said about teenagers that came to, I don't know if you were here when Rita uh, Crosby gave her speech, but she said about the teenage Americans that came and her father escaped and seen all the teenage Americans. I was one of those teenagers. <laughs> So without further ado, I've, I'll try to get into this. Um, I also am going to give some of the lighter sides of war. There is another side of war besides the the crazy killings and all that stuff going on. But we did, there were some lighter times, and I want to relay some of those messages. So I'm going to start with our, what I got. Already said. I am George Moore. I guess I have to get closer here. A World War II veteran, currently president of the Reading, Pennsylvania Chapter 64, the battle, Veterans of the Battle of Bulbs. I served in the e e European Theater of Operations in General Patton's Third Army in the 1252nd Engineer Combat Battalion. An unattached a battalion, I have three combat stars, the Ardennes, which is the Battle of the Bulbs, Central Europe, and Rhineland campaigns. I was born January the 5th, 1926, in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, in Montgomery County. I attended Lower Pottsgrove Elementary School, Pottstown Junior and Senior High Schools. I graduated June 1943 at the age of 17 years of age. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, I was a 15-year-old, 15 years of age, junior in high school, I had no thoughts of going to war. That was soon to change. While finishing high school, I read and heard the progress of the war. The reports were not very encouraging. After graduating in June at the age of 17, I started to work in a defense plant in Pottstown, Dolor die casting, uh, they make die castings in, uh, in the Pottstown area. This would later play a part in my assignment in the military. I was offered a position in the garage of their trucking fleet as a mechanic's helper. I soon developed skills in the trucking industry. I was rebuilding engines, working in maintenance, and all the other duties. I also learned how to handle and drive semi-trucks and trailers. got my Pennsylvania driver's license when I turned 18 years of age. I was drafted in April 1944 into the Army. I had asked for the Navy. And all in front of me got stamped Navy, Navy, Navy. But when I got there, they stamped me Army. <laughs> they, must, they must have had their, their quota, and I, and I was stamped in the Army. And I, as it turned out, I was glad that it turned out that way because we went to New Cumberland and in Pennsylvania and had my physical and was inducted on April 14, 1944. A group of mostly 18-year-olds some 30 and 38 year olds were shipped to Camp Swift, Texas, where we found out we were to be part of the 1252nd Engineer Combat Battalion. We started 13 weeks of basic training in the hot Texas sun near Austin, Texas, and it was hot. While in the first weeks of training, I found out I was one of a very few who could handle driving, shifting gears, and trucks. I soon would be teaching others how to do so. I would be assigned an MOS number, as a light truck driver. MOS stands for Military Occupational Specialty. After about six, seven, this is one of my tricks I played now. After about seven weeks of basic training, while out in the field, a runner came out and called for Corporal Dunn and Moore to report to 
charge of quarters for orders. We reported in and told, we were told to pack and report for duty in Aberdeen, Maryland at the Proving Grounds for Special Diesel Mechanic School. I thought, boy, that's great. That's pretty close to home. So I packed and got ready to go. They gave the traveling orders to uh, Corporal Dunn. He was, a, he was cadre and he was there when, the, when we started to form and had been in the Army for some time. Well, we went to the Austin to get on the train. For the first time, I glanced at the orders and quickly noticed that the Moore name on the orders was not me, but Charles Moore. I decided at the old age of 18 to remain silent and play dumb. So off we went. When the MPs asked for orders, I would say, I'm with Corporal Dunn. When they checked for papers, I was okayed. That was in St. Louis, Missouri and we were not checked again. So far, so good. <laughs> Corporal Dunn had relatives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so we jumped trains overnight so he could see, his, see them and continued to our next day, on our next day to Aberdeen, Maryland. When we reported to a captain at Aberdeen, Maryland, on the proving grounds, Corporal Dunn gave his, the orders stating his name, rank, and serial number. I followed and did the same. The captain asked me to repeat my name, and I did so. I said, Private George Moore, 934-118, reporting for duty, sir. He said, that's not the name on the orders. I said, I've never seen the orders, sir, because <laughs> Corporal Dunn was in charge. <laughs> I guess I played dumb pretty good. <laughs> he, then, he then wired Texas and my CO, my company commander, looked up my records and said, and saw I was qualified. They decided since I was already there, I should stay there. Lucky me. My ruse, out, ruse worked out just fine. Not bad for a kid whose aunts all said I would never survive because it was the first time I was off my mom's apron strings. <laughs> my mom was, a, was a, one of 13 children. I had lots of aunts and uncles. I had three uncles that were in World War II and one uncle in World War I. The last uncle I graduated high school with, we were in the same class, we were the same age. <laughs> so he, he, got, he was one of the two in the Navy and the other two were in the Army. I guess maybe that's why I wanted Navy, I don't know. We finished the four week course and I finished second in my class, which I thought was pretty good. Upon graduation, we were supposed to be, I was supposed to be promoted to a T4, which is a tech sergeant. But ratings were frozen. I never did get the rank. We, when we finished, Corporal Dunn wired Texas and asked for a day, delay en route. Basic training was nearly complete. We went to our homes, and they sent us a 15-day de delay en route. We were home for 17 days. When we got back, the company was already packed for shipment overseas. Soon we left Camp Swift for Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. The first day we were there, they had some 12 hours, 50 mile passes. I went and asked for one. The commanding officer said, wait until tomorrow. I said, I don't want to wait till tomorrow. I want to go that day. He asked me where I was going. I said, a lot further than 50 miles. I'm going to Pottstown, <laughs> Pennsylvania. Well, after some conniving, he gave in and gave me a pass. Now this is an 18 year old kid, never been away from home. You know? And uh, with a warning, if you are not back in time, there will be some dire circumstances. And I added here, such as losing some of my body parts. I, I got home to see my parents, my family. I got back in good time. There were the last passes issued. I was one of the few that got an issue, bef got a pass before we went overseas. Even the officers didn't get any. We were about to embark for England. On October the 20th, 1944, we left Camp Kilmer, New Jersey at 7.30 for New York City Harbor. Company A and B, and I was in A Company, were the advance party for the entire ship. 11.30 a.m. we had boarded Her Majesty's ship, the HMS Tamarora, which was a transport from New Zealand and, and used for transporting meat. It was converted into a troop transport, and not too favorably, I might add. Companies A and B were in charge of mess, and what a mess, KP and guard duty. This was the beginning of a very, very unpleasant voyage. We left New York City dock Sunday, October 22, 1944, bound for Avonmouth, England. Fifty ships were in the convoy. 
one Italian, two Dutch, the rest were British and American. I, I, at that time, we only knew of one sub-scare, but much later, in November 1945, we learned that two ships were sunk from our convoy, also learning that the HSM Tamarora was sunk in December 1944. Now, that's the ship we went over on. This was probably her next voyage. I do hope the crew got off safely. Getting back to the voyage on the, on the Tamarora, by the end of the, first, of the second day out, I ran out of candy bars, which was about the only thing I could eat on that ship. I, and the British were our allies, but they didn't know how to cook. Our menu consists of, of things like steamed, steamed or stewed liver and onions, and this is for breakfast and the likes of that, stewed mutton, stewed kidneys, etc. Not to the liking of any American GIs that I knew. The only thing I could eat was very bland boiled rice. And to this day, I don't like rice. <laughs> One day while I was down in the hull of the ship, I spotted a whole frozen Lebanon bologna. Being rather slim, and I was slim, I weighed all the way to 130 pounds, I think, five foot 10. I put it up my sleeve in, of my feet fatigues and liberated it to my company A. We had some meat we could eat for that one day anyway. After 11 days on the ship, we weighed anchor in the British Channel, November the 1st, 1944. We were told we had to stay on two more days. Not good news. The chow was the worst I ever eaten. Uh, finally, after cleaning the ship, we embarked for Torquay, England. H&S Company pre prepared a meal for us, the first good meal we had since we boarded the H&S Tamarora. And there's a little story in that, too. I, I said I'd run out of candy bars. Uh, we were paid, I think Bob said set, uh, seven, 60 bucks. We did get 75 after we got overseas. But uh, $50 a month, and I, they had games on, the, on, on deck, uh, card games, the dice, etc. So I lost all my money, so I couldn't buy any more rations anyway. But when we got to England, I borrowed $5 off one of my buddies. I went and bought some rations. And I got into a pinochle game, and within a week I run that five dollars into a thousand dollars, sent four hundred dollars home, and the rest of it I spent mostly in the Rising Pub, Rising Sun Pub in Torquay, England. <laughs> I got I got to know the Brits pretty well over there. Ah, uh, where was we? Okay, in Torquay. We would have more training, mostly land and personnel mines. We also got to know the local pubs, which I told you, and the English people during the time. And at that time, Corporal Olsen was out drinking and got a little tipsy. Brought a Belgian draft horse into the second floor barracks, not the usual pet animal. No harm was done, but I don't know how he got that horse up to the second barrack. <laughs> but he's a character. You'll find that out later, too, in, the, in, his, in my talk. November the 19th, 1944, we received, we received our shipment number for the continent. We kept training until December 13th, 1944, when we were alerted for departure. However, the orders did not come down. The Battle of the Bulge broke out, and I was pretty lucky in all these dates. In December 16th, 44, and we were still in England. That's pretty much of a break for me. We had Christmas in Torquay, England, which was a resort town on the coast of England. It was a pretty nice little town. We were packed and ready to go. Finally, December 28, 1944, we departed for the marshalling area. We boarded ship, a Polish ship, the SS Sobieski, and landed in La Havre, France, December 31st, 1944, 1400 hours. That was my grandfather's birthday. I remember that well. We disembarked, disembarked and marched 10, 10 miles up Red Horse Hill with full field packs, slept in a muddy field until 3 a.m., loaded on trucks for a cold ride to a pasture, pitched tents in the snow, more cold. Two more similar moves, and we were in Rouen, France. It was now the 10th of January, and we were loaded, we were loaded in the back of a six-by truck to go get vehicles. I and another man got a Jeep along the... With a convoy, we headed to our, to our outfit. The Jeep broke down, naturally, and the convoy went on. Later, we got the Jeep started, and I don't know how we did, and we headed towards Rouen, France, the, place, the last place we were at. 
We did not know where the 1252nd Battalion was located. It was getting dark, getting near dark, and we were very cold, and it was cold. I'm sure I saw, suffered some frostbite on that of the feet and hands. My partner knocked on a French farmhouse door and somehow conveyed we were like a drink. I think he asked for cedar, but I have whiskey. It, but it had to help us warm our insides. The French farmer bought us coffee with a shot of cognac, a coffee royale. That's the best drink I ever had. We thanked him and proceeded to a freight yard in Paris suburbs. It was dark and I crawled into a box car and slept overnight. The next morning we started back towards Rouen, France. Going down a road, I saw a B-17 bomber down in the field with American soldiers around. I stopped, saw a colonel, and asked if he knew where we 1252nd Battalion was located. After giving me the third degree, he decided we were okay and said, you did a good job, soldier. They're seven miles down the road. I reported to the captain, and he asked me where I'd been. The company was packing. We were on our way to the Battle of the Bulls. The company was loaded. Oh, he asked, also asked me if I had fun that night. I wonder if the girl was nice. The company was, which that was not so, but the company was loaded in a 40 and 8 boxcars for a long, cold, 54-hour ride to Beware, Luxembourg. It was January 16, 1945. I drove in a convoy. We were at the front in our first combat zone and half frozen to death. We got our first assignment January the 22nd, 1945. We were spread out all over the six, over 6,000 yards along the Moselle, Moselle River between Merchert and Munchecker, Luxembourg. Across the river was the 11th Panther Tank Division of the German Army. Our job was to man foxhole lines. We were spread out dangerously thin. It took our entire company to man two 12-hour day and night shifts. Uh, Although the official date of the bulge is just about over, we started getting our casualties after that. The, the war was not over when the bulge was ended. It, uh, we, we had quite a, quite a few combat missions. We suffered our first casualties January the 27th, 1945. The night relief was on the way to the front positions, was caught in the open and full of few of the Germans. They, our first platoon, was pinned down by mortars, machine guns, small arm fire, six wounded, five evacuated, one very seriously. Luckily, I was in the third platoon, and I wasn't out on that patrol at, at that time. We maintained these positions until February the 4th, 1945, being relieved by the 1258 Engineer Combat Battalion. Now, they trained in Camp Swift where we did. While at the front, we were attached to the 2nd Cavalry of the 6th Armored Division, the 87th Infantry Division, and the 76th Infantry Division. We departed for Flaxweiler, Luxembourg. A break and rest was expected, but after a few days, we were alerted to be ready to move in, minutes, in 15 minutes' notice. We were ordered to move out and drove all night blackout driving, bound for Eckweiler, Luxembourg, which was a hot spot. Our convoy got split up and got lost. It was raining and much colder. Some of, some of us got it in about 600 hours, other, and I was among those. Others were spread out over northern Luxembourg and southern Belgium. The rest arrived later that day or the next morning. I remember arriving falling asleep in an open-air jeep in a driving rainstorm. Our company commander woke me up and made me seek shelter. On the 10th of February, 1945, we were ordered to Walhausen, Luxembourg. We were at the front again. This time, we were on the uplands west of the R River in plain view, or plain sight of the Germans, back to our foxholes again. On our first relief, we were pinned down machine gun by machine gun fire, and when that stilled, in came the mortars. To the rear, our town, Walhausen, Luxembourg, was shoveled several times a day with screaming memes rocket artillery fire. Our stay at Walhausen passed without serious effects until the last relief was getting home. The Germans let loose with rocket and mortar fire, wounding several men, still no fatal fatalities. A, a patrol was ordered on February 20th, 1945, to clean out the town of Unter in Luxembourg and bring back information. Things went well till deep into town. 
Then all hell broke loose. One man was killed, the rest pinned down till dark. The captain pulled the remainder of the patrol back to better positions on the edges of town. To get, a, to get back to our foxholes, we had to ascend a steep hill in open territory. Another man was killed and more wounded. Later, most got back to town. All this going on, I, I never got a wound over it. The biggest thing I got was when I dove into a foxhole and hit a sea ration can, cut my wrist. Somehow I missed all the mortar fire and everything else. On the 25th of, 21st of February, in 45, we put a footbridge across our, the Our River, O-U-R, near the town of Dossberg, Luxembourg. The following day, our Company A became tank cowboys and spearheaded an attack with Combat Command A of the 6th Armored Division into the Siegfried, Siegfried Line, captured towns of Priest, Chat, Affler, and Uber Eisenbach. Casualties were light compared to the test. We were more than glad to rush these towns, however, which had caused our casualties. We captured about 70 prisoners. We also sold pillboxes, had to blow out some, a few krauts, Germans, 13 pillboxes in all. It was here, flip a page, Dad. At a bridge later in the day, I was standing my, by my Jeep and heard the whiz of a bullet go my, by my ear and smack into the bank behind me. Thankfully, the sniper missed me by inches. I guess that Kraut was probably cross-eyed. At least I hope he was. Friday, February 23rd, 1945, was spent guarding a bridge near Affler. We caught more, eight more prisoners who were going to blow the bridge. Saturday, the 24th, 1941, was spent sweeping roads for mines. We, had, we got 19 LPZ landmines and countless tree demolitions removed and detonated and we returned to Constant Luxembourg later that night for rest. <clears throat> we, cleaned up, we cleaned up and packed for another, another move to Belgium on the 25th of February, 1945. We we're about to give up our jobs as infantrymen and become engineers. We had, the, the whole time we were there, were combat infantry more than engineers. So we moved to Sar St. Sarle Saint Vith, it's uh, in Belgium, a town just west of Saint Vith. Here we were to maintain roads. The place was complete destruction. I mean, complete. What it was once a beautiful city was nothing but complete rubble. While its cellars still walled, they're dead. The locals here all spoke only German and seemed to be fans of the Huns or the Germans. We settled into road work, and boy, did it need it. What was left was all mud. We constructed a lot of corduroy roads from logs. It was hard, muddy work, but it was much easier than combat. On March the 2nd, 1945, we moved out of St. Vith area and moved to Brock, Belgium, closer to our section for maintaining roads. The people here were unfriendly, and you could tell we were nearing Germany. We were the first Americans there, which might have had something to do with the way they felt about us. March 7th, 1945, brought us to Hallenfeld, Germany. We cared for roads and to Bilaf to Prom, Germany, the latter being a dirty, stinking hole of rubble. By the time our convoy had large considerably, and I mean, we were a company of combat engineers, but when we moved out, we looked like a battalion. Uh, we were known as Joe's Traveling Circus. We had many trailers, a light pant, jury jeep, armored cars, 1938 Buick club car, Plymouth converted into a town, uh, one, one three-quarter ton truck, a circus wagon, and this is how, I don't know who got them, but we had a camel, we had monkeys, we had circus wagon, but we, we got and we took along. And also two Polish youth, about 12 years of age, which we adopted, named them Iggy and Ziggy, they traveled with us until the end of the war. I just named two of our goldfish, Iggy and Ziggy, by the way. I, my grandchildren here can attest to that. Uh, where was it? All the village were mostly deserted at that time, and we seldom saw anyone. On the 14th of March, 1945, we start out again. It had rained for days, and we had not seen sun at all in March. The weather was terribly cold and damp. Mud was knee-deep. We were on our way to Booz, Germany, 
Booz was a beautiful, was beautiful and had not suffered a shot. We were about 50 miles from the Rhine River in back of Koblenz, Germany. Our duty was highway care. On the 24th of March, 1945, we moved out of Booz and traveled to Bubach, Germany. We were a few miles west of the Rhine River. And after a few days road, road work, our battalion was alerted to help huge task force in the assault crossing the Rhine River, Germany's last line of defense at St. Gorhausen. Now, Bob said when uh, Bob Huber, if you had heard the new guy before, said the banks were so steep they didn't know how they could get the assault boats there. We drove them in, but the Navy did bring them to us also. And we were combat engineers, you know, had it easy. We, uh, we uh, paddled the infantry across that river. And, uh, and it, was, it was under fire. And this was uh, at St. Gore's house. And we relieved, relieved the 168th engineers, ferrying the 354th Regiment of the 89th Infantry Division under fire across the river, March 26, 1945. My company, A, was extremely lucky again with light casualties. The 168th engineers, however, were not so lucky. Altogether, there were about 400 casualties. Those 20 millimeters did a job. They were firing 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns at our troops. And like he said, there was 12 men to a boat, and we paddled them. Uh, he said they paddled upstream. Our, ours, our boats ended up a quarter mile downstream. The Rhine was very swift, and it was a mile ride at that place. Uh, we rode the boats, of course, to a very swollen river with no pic was, it was no picnic. My company completed the crossing half of the allotted time, however, and returned to Bubach, Germany. On the 28th of March, 1945, we crossed the Rhine River and took possession of Leerscheid in Germany. The people were afraid since we were the first co to occupy the town. We got the townspeople out. We burned all the Nazi uniforms in front of front of them. Some of some Rhine wine appeared, and I don't know how mysteriously that happened. And some of us celebrated a little too much. When I, a lot of them celebrated a little too much. Before this move, we had to give up some of our convoy. The colonel nixed our, all our equipment because of our gas shortage. Sadly, we left behind the armored car, the jury power plant, and some trailers while there. And I think that's where we lost our camels. However, we did have the monkeys till the end of the war. I do remember that because one of them set, uh, smuggled a boat on, that's later, but onto a boat when we were about ready to go to Japan. And I think one of them went overboard, pretty the poor monkey. Uh, while, Lieutenant, while Lieutenant and I were getting out set, sent out in a recon, we would uh, soon pass the 87th Infantry Division on the road. Shortly, we came to signs saying, roads no longer cleared of mines. Lieutenant Garrett said, keep going. We were 25 miles behind the enemy lines. Civilians were coming up and sort of in this position. Comrade, comrade, I said. <laughs> and raising, shouting comrade. I said, what in the hell are we doing back here? We did get back, however. And okay, the war was winding down. On April the 2nd, 1945, we moved to Lorsch, Germany. Really nice billets. Baths, kitchens, lots of wine. The best setup since we had since leaving the United States. What a beautiful country. I also had a full dress suit on at that time. I looked like an American kid again with a with a suit on. We shortly shortly started the task of Set, putting up a floating Bailey Bridge across the widest part of the Rhine River. We would have finished what some said was an impossible task, but General came by and stopped the proceedings. It was here that I got in trouble, not me alone, though. One night, Corporal Olson, the same GI who had the Belgian draft horse in his second floor barracks in England, and Sergeant Kruger came and told me to get my Jeep, we're going down to the Rhine River. We went to a wine cellar that, had, that they had scoped out. Olsen went in and convinced the German owner of the wine cellar to give us 80 quarts of wine. Corporal Olsen signed a paper using General Eisenhower's name. Sorry, Ike, I'm, it's, it's a lot later, but he was my general at the time. 
So we used his name, and we got the wine. That wasn't the, the worst part of it. We, lo we loaded the wa Jeep and started back. It was pitch black and dark, and we were driving with just cat eyes. Soon I saw a flashing light. Now, if you remember, Bob Sandy walls were sheer along the line. They were. When it's dark, couldn't see nothing. So all we have is the little cat eyes. And I saw a flashlight wave, and the guy said, watch, the, watch it on the right. It was another engineer outfit. There's a little low boy parked over there. I said, fine. The three of us in the, in the Jeep and loaded it with 80 quarts of wine. Moved to the left. Just got the second gear. I see a big dark edge. Boom. Uh, we had three guys hit the windshield, 80 quarts of wine all over us. I totaled that Jeep. And I got back the next day. I can add a little. A little. The CO said, where were you last night? I said, we went to the Rhine. He said, what are you doing down there? I said, one of the guys left his rifle down there, and uh, we went down to retrieve it. He said, what else did you do? Oh, I said, we stopped and got a little wine. He said, it's a darn good thing you told me because you stink just like a brewery. <laughs> so he said, that's the end of your driving. But that didn't last long either. They needed a driver. But they did put me back on the line, but the line was getting further and further. It was The war was really winding down at that time. Uh, they failed to tell me about that low boy, and I hit it full head on. I, went, I live in here. So. I, I was the next day I was called on the carpet. I, I told you that. Now, being a low rank, I took the rap, rap for the rest of them. And I, yeah, I, I told you what happened. And On the 10th of, of April 1945, we moved to Heimbach near Frankfurt, Germany, captured 27 more prisoners, worked one day on the Autobahn. Now, capturing prisoners, I was, I said I was a teenager. I was already 19 at that time. But I took, I, on a Jeep, I took five, six prisoners at a time, loaded them in the back of a Jeep, handed them out cigarettes. But the point of it is, they were, I was a kid, but there were kids on there 14, 15 years old. The grandfathers, I looked like grandfathers to me, were, 60, 65 years of old. That's all they had left anymore, and that was the Wehrmacht. Uh, okay. On April the 12th, 1945, we moved 70 miles east to begin a 214-foot trestle bent timber bridge over the Wehra River. We worked 24 hours a day with strafing. A bed check Charlie came by every night. We finished the 70-ton bridge in seven days, the 19th of April, 1945. That's a 200-foot, two-way timber bridge. They held traffic. We finished it in seven days. Takes seven years to get an order, Pennsylvania. We kept moving south and deeper into Germany. Finally, on May the 6th, we moved to Passau, Germany, where the Ilse, the Inn, and the Danube rivers merged. We were ordered to put up another bridge across the Ilse River. We put up 160 two-foot pile-bent bridge, finished on May 13, 1940. 70-ton, two-way two bridge in seven days again, which lasted at least 20 years because we had guys that went over there and saw the bridge afterwards and uh, said it was still there. And that's a bunch of ragtag kids, 8, 19, 20 years old, and we could do it then, and they can't do it nowadays. The war ended May the 7th. We were strafed May the 8th by a P-51. And shot, we shot down a German recon plane. From there, we had various duties, jobs. We had guarding prisoners, road work, sweating out going to the Pacific, which we were eventually told that's where we're going. We're going to the Pacific. So we worked our way back to Marseille, France, loaded our equipment and ammunition aboard ship bound for the Pacific. Our president, Harry, dropped, Harry Truman dropped at two atomic bombs, our orders were changed, and we were off to Boston Harbor instead, arriving September the 4th, 1945, two days after they signed the, the treaty on the Missouri. I received a 45-day delay en route to Camp Polk, Louisiana, where we were disbanded, and I was overseas and back before my 20th birthday. Uh, I wasn't done with the Army. I was ironically sent back to Camp Swift, Texas to finish my tour where I took my basic training in the 2nd Infantry Division. So that was a little turn of face. 
Again, I thank you for allowing me the opportunity of relating some of my stories to you. I'd be happy to entertain any questions that I can answer, comments you might have at this time. Thank you very much, folks. It's really an honor to be invited here. I really appreciate it. And thank you once again. Any questions? Yeah. Well, I got... What kind of wine do you like today? <laughs> uh, mostly the dry wine, like uh, uh, Merlot, Chabon, whatever it is. But mostly the dry. The Italian wine, I like that the best. I didn't like that white wine that much. First time, April, I started down there early April or mid-April of 1944. Were you there, sir? Well, I was there in 1943. I took my basic training in 97 97. I was a strictly a 1252nd Combat Engineer Battalion. Uh, mostly around were engineers at the time. I was a late comer into the war. I, like I said, I wasn't in a hurry to get there. But I got there, nonetheless. I was one of those kids that had to go over there. But th th then I ended up in Camp Swift for six months after that in the infantry. I said, after being a combat engineer, I'm in the infantry. So I ended up in the quartermaster part of the infantry. I was driving truck. I had a lucrative job. I got lots of uniforms and the likes of that. Any other questions, sir? I ended up in the eighth division. Beg pardon? After the basic. Oh, okay. I went into the 9th uh, Infantry Regiment as a 2nd Infantry. Yes, sir? Do you have any good patent stories? Well, <laughs> I have some. They're not all mine. I do know that our C Company, while we were up there in the Bolts, we got there late. We were a bunch of kids. And Patton came along in a Jeep, and, and uh, I, knew, I knew the guy that had him. They stopped him. Had him under an M1, and I said, see who you are, you know. Made him identify himself, uh, but he appreciated that, really. He, he, we were doing our job, that's one. Uh, our past commander, Sam, Sam Scales, he was a retired minister, he always tells a story about when they, I think you may have seen it in a Patton movie where the Jeep got, uh, where the convoy got stuck in the mud and what have you. And he, was, uh, he went up and he said, get this, get this, let's get this going. And Sam was sitting on a half track and came up to me and said, what's the matter, soldier? Didn't you have breakfast this morning? Sam didn't like Patton too much, but I did. He was a good guy. Any other questions? He was up front a lot. That, that wasn't a lie. He was up there. He wasn't, he wasn't too shy. What's the true story about how he I don't know the true story. I never, I never believed it, but they, everybody that knows anything about it says he did die that way. I thought he was set up myself, but I don't know. But it was never proven otherwise. He died in that truck accident, and that's the way it was. In the story of Patton's chaplain, Jim O'Neill, writing the prayer, Fair weather was a fascinating story. Yeah, well, Patton, that's one of the reasons why Sam didn't like him. He was a, Sam, he could uh, be ripping the language, part, uh, language to pieces in one minute and swearing and carrying on and then praying God the next. I see you were in the Battle of the Bulls also, sir. What chapter are you in? I'm president of the Lehigh Valley chapter. Lehigh Valley. Well, I may have talked to you on the phone a couple times. I'm not sure. But we're reading chapter, you know that. We've talked more. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you, my friend. God bless you. Anything else? Have you been back? Have you been back to the, to the Europe? No, I didn't make it. A lot of our guys did. Just a year or so ago, uh, my grandmother was Irish, and I, my wife and I planned to go to Ireland, but I got dumb and had an accident. I had to buy a car, and that there. That really wiped out the Irish trip. I don't know 
Maybe if I live long enough, I might get back over. I really didn't have too much desire to go back. I love Germany as as it's picturesque. It's. I ended up, by the way, in in Berchtesgaden. I was down there. I was on the lake on the lake where Hitler had his castle at Harem Kimsey. It was. Modeled, modeled after the castle of Versailles, beautiful, and it was untouched. Uh, even the GIs left it alone, which is, but it was, a, it was a nice experience. I had some other experience that I couldn't put in here in such a short time. But we got around, I got around pretty good for an 18, 19 year old kid that wasn't supposed to be able to do it. Anything else from anybody? Once, once again, I'm, very pleased to come up and talk to you. I hope you enjoyed my speech a little bit. Thank you very much.